feels weird not to say classes take their places. This is the only class, so here we are. We are uh, happy to be back here for Bible study again on Sundays, so good to have everybody this morning. Hope everybody had a good 4th of July. I know some of you have been busy with the wedding and a long day yesterday, but everything was really pretty yesterday. It was a nice ceremony, and we're, of course, happy for Spencer and Whitney and the entire family. So, uh, Our study this morning is going to come from Exodus. We're going to be studying from Exodus the next, or in July. Uh, we're going to have a different speaker every week, and there's 40 chapters in Exodus, so each of us are going to take about 10 chapters each and hit some points in those 10 chapters. So I have the first 10 this morning, and we're calling this study Outcry. Uh, because Exodus, there's a lot of crying out done by God's people. So um, we're trying to kind of relate this to what we're going through right now in our country. A lot of the situations at hand, um, we're just trying to relate that to this study. So some of our goals for the study, we of course want to go through this and know God better. Uh, we want to love God more and our fellow man. We want to have continued unity despite differing opinions, societal unrest, and emotions. Of course, with coronavirus, uh, there's talks of racism. We, of course, know all those situations that are currently going on in, uh, in our country right now. So to set the setting of Exodus as the uh, book opens up, uh, the Israelites, they are in Egypt. And our kids in here, do you all remember the story of Joseph? Um, why did Joseph find himself in uh, a foreign country? Do you remember? All right. Joseph had a coat of many colors. He seemed to be favored by his dad. Do you remember that? Uh, they were jealous of him. Um, they sought to end his life, but ended up selling him into a foreign country. And of course, uh, we know how that story played out. Uh, Joseph ended up in Egypt, and uh, later there was prophecy that God was going to have seven good years of harvest, followed by seven years of famine. And that ended up leading the Israelites into Egypt. Um, and they found favor with the king of Egypt, and they were blessed. But the setting in Exodus, Joseph has passed. He's passed away. And there's a new king in power. And the Israelites, they've lost their graces with the king. So times have changed for the Israelites. Uh, the Israelites are also becoming very uh, numerous. And there's a lot of them there. And the Egyptians are worried that they are going to uh, overpower the Egyptians. So they enslave the Egyptians, or they enslave the Israelites. They start making them work for them. So Israel, they cry out for help, and God hears them. The author of the book is believed to be Moses. So we don't really hear a lot from God from the time of Joseph's death until the time of Moses' birth. But again, the Israelites, they find themselves enslaved in Egypt, and I'm sure to an extent maybe they felt forgotten. Uh, maybe they were wondering, you know, how long is this going to last? Again, they had experienced those good years of harvest, and then uh, it was followed by a famine, and that's why they found themselves in that country. So one of the points we want to hit as we um, start in chapter 1, and I feel like this is relevant for us today, is obeying government versus God. When do we know which to do? Um, and again, there's an element in this in the first chapter of Exodus. So can I get somebody to volunteer to read Exodus 1, 15 through 17? I have it on the screen, but... It may be too small if I could get a volunteer to read that. And the king of Egypt spoke to the victor, the Hebrew midwives, 
of which the name of the one was Shepra, and the other was Pira. And he said, when do you, uh, uh, this, the office of, when you do the office of the midwife of the Hebrew women and see them upon the students, if it be a son, then you shall give it. And if it be a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men and children alive. Okay, so for our kids, I want to try to make this relatable for everybody. Uh, when we read about these midwives, kids, do you all know what a midwife is? No, okay. That's somebody who's helping deliver a baby, okay? So these Hebrew midwives, these Hebrew uh, uh, Israelites, they were responsible for delivering these babies, but the king of Egypt wanted them... Uh, to kill the boy babies when they were born. What would have been the purpose of doing this? Why did he want them to kill the baby boys? What was the thought process behind that? Remember the Israelites, they're becoming very numerous in the land so he wants to combat that so if you take away the boy babies that messes up reproduction right okay but it says that the hebrew midwives what did they do it says they feared who it says they feared god so they did not obey the king they were living under and you know the bible gives us guidance when we should obey government and when we should disobey government uh, if you read in Romans 13, 1 through 7, you know, it talks about we may not like some of the people who are in our government. We may not trust them. We may not agree with them. But God has given them short-term authority. Uh, and we are to obey them as long as they're not asking us to do anything that violates God's law. Uh, when we disobey them, we find in Acts 5, 28 through 29, we need to disobey our government when they're asking us to do something that violates God's law. Um, I know we've had, you know, a lot of talk of that going through these times the last few months. Um, so, anybody have any thoughts on that with our government and what's going on right now? All right. I would venture to say that most of the things that we're doing right now that is being commanded by the government, we don't like. Right. But uh, even though we don't like it because we are a, a law abiding country and a law I think that the church has an obligation to set the example uh, for this side. This, the, this mask, for example, I despise yeah. it. Right. But. I wear it because that's what I'm commanded to do. Yeah, and, and it doesn't violate what God wants from us. Yeah. And I agree. I feel it would, we would be hindering the gospel if the church, you know, stood up against these things. I don't know that people would see God shining through us if we combated these things like this. All right, so we want to look at Moses and his story a little bit. Uh, and there's just a there's an element here of God's timing versus man's timing. And does anybody struggle with that? I personally struggle with that. You know, I want things to happen when I want it to happen, and sometimes that's just not when God wants it to happen. Um, but when we look at the uh, character of Moses, he was possibly thought and told he was going to be a leader. And I hadn't really realized that before I started studying this. Um, he also continued to fear God even though he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. We have to remember the story of Moses. You know, uh, the king was telling them to kill the boy babies, uh, but his parents kind of escaped that and they put him in the Nile and he ended up being uh, rescued from the waters and being raised by Pharaoh's daughter, the king's daughter. So uh, 
like I said, it was thought that he was told that he was going to be a leader. So we find that in Hebrews 11, 23 through 25. Exodus doesn't really tell us that. But can I get somebody to read that for me? Hebrews 11, 23 through 25. And again, I hadn't realized this before I started studying this. Greg? By faith, Moses' parents hid him three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. And they were not afraid of the king's enemies. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated, a lot of people God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. All right. So we get the perspective of Moses' parents. They didn't see him as an ordinary child. So I think what that's trying to tell us is they saw him as a possible leader for their people. And again, I hadn't realized that before I started studying. Um, and this took great faith by Moses. I mean, it says it in verse 24. Instead of... Uh, says, instead of being known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he chose to be mistreated along with his people. Don't you know that was a big decision for him? Because, you know, he could have enjoyed probably the luxuries of, you know, being like an Egyptian, but he chose to be like the Israelites who were being mistreated and enslaved. Ryan, if I could just point out one other thing here that might have something to do with this. When Moses was not killed, he was in violation of the king's decree. That was a violation of the law. Uh, but it wasn't God's law, it was man's law. And there's an analogy to that in the New Testament when Jesus, uh, they commanded all the boy babies to be killed at the time of Jesus. Uh, Joseph and his mother took him down to Egypt, ironically, of all places. Yeah. Uh, and they were in violation of man's law by saving Jesus' life. And right. Remember, they didn't come back until they found out that the king was dead. So there's two instances of where they violated the law of the land yeah. in favor of God's. Right. Yeah. I didn't think about that. That's true. And there's a lot of stuff from Exodus that ties into the story of Jesus. It's just yeah. really tons and tons of stuff. One of the things every, every time I think of it, and I can't help but equate it, is that man's law says abortion is legal. There have been since Roe versus Wade, 1973, Supreme Court. But God's law says it's not legal, that it is not good to kill babies, or, 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 or. Right. So there's a difference in the law that we have taken into account. Right, right. Sorry. No, no. We need all the discussion we can get. Okay, so Moses was thought to be a leader for his people. But this is what happened at age 40. So at age 40, we find in Exodus 2, 11 through 14. Can somebody read that for me? One day after Moses had grown up, he was sent out to where his people were and watched them at their hard labor. We saw the Egyptian So, you know, raised in Pharaoh's house, um, cho chose to be mistreated like his people. Uh, so at age 40, Moses sees an opportunity. He sees one of his fellow Israelites being mistreated, so he chooses to kill the Egyptian. Sin or not a sin? Sin? Any other thoughts? Thou shalt not kill. That came along a little bit later. But we don't know all the details of what 
he had to do in order to kill this Egyptian because the Egyptian was mistreating or maybe killing his fellow Hebrew. Mm-hmm. So I think the next, yeah. the next verse is we're going to look at. It talks about he was doing it in defense. Yeah. I don't know if that justifies it, but but it, you know. You have to take that to yeah, you do. Yeah. So this is what this is what Moses did. He thought at age forty, this is my moment. This is my chance to lead my people. Um, but let's read on a little bit more. So this is what Moses thought would happen when he killed that Egyptian. So we find this in Acts, Acts seven twenty three through twenty five. Can I get a reader? Right. When Moses was forty years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw no other than being treated by the Egyptians, so he went to his friends and the village to invite them to visit. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was giving them the rest of them, but they did not. Okay, so I I personally think this is a story of God's timing versus man's timing. Um, Moses thought when he acted in this way, what did he think? He thought the people would realize he was acting as a rescuer and that that would be his moment to help save his people. But they didn't react in that way. So, of course, we know uh, Moses ended up fleeing. He went to a different land. And he was actually gone for 40 years. Okay, so we talked about how there's just a lot. Again, I'm covering the first 10 chapters, but there's a lot of outcrying in the book of Exodus. And I've cited some scripture here where it talks about the Israels crying out to God. And I think if you turn to each of those, um, you're going to find out the reason for their crying out. It was because of their slavery. And it was because of their slave drivers. So I want us to think this morning, should we have an outcry as the church in 2020? Uh, What are some things we should be crying out to God about as the church in 2020? Yeah. I didn't hear that. What you say? He said we went for like a month, a month and a half without being able to meet. Yeah. Um, so, any other thoughts? The direction of our nation. For sure. The direction of our country. Um, like we say, 2020 has brought a lot of challenges. It's not things we didn't know it didn't already exist, but. Uh, I don't think any of us saw a situation like we're going through coming six months ago. So, any other thoughts? I mean, if you watch, if you watch the media, you know, it's almost like we're the bad guys now. And I, I seem to think that we're heading in a direction where, I think I read last week, like, in the direction where two percent of the population is going to end up controlling ninety-eight percent of the population. You know, so the radicals are the ones that are making the news, and the silent majority is just standing by, and kind of letting it happen. And I think we'll get to this today, but like that's what I love about God. God is unchanging. Um, we know what He wants. We know we have His word. It doesn't change, but that's the problem I have with the media right now. You check one site, and it might read one way. Then you go to a different site, and it's just, I don't know what information to believe. There's just a lot of information being circulated and a lot of confusion, and I don't know, maybe that's the intent, to keep well, everybody confused. one thing that we need to keep in our mind as Christians. Uh, how much positive is the Bible going to Thought through this, I just think we need to be praying to God that He 
you know, times are hard, but that he molds us and makes us into what he wants us to be through these days and just uses us. Okay, so uh, we know that Moses fled to another land. And like I said, he was age 40 when he killed the Egyptian. But 40 years past, he's at age 80. And God comes to Moses. And this is found in Exodus 3, 1 through 6. Can I get a reader for that? Here we have the presence of God, to a degree, coming before Moses. And how does Moses react? What did it say that he did? He hid his face. He was afraid. I kind of just want us to think about that this morning. Uh, When we look at other accounts in the Bible, when people come into the presence of God, a lot of times, what is the reaction? Why do people react in this way? What's your thoughts? Ashamed of, Ashamed of guilt because God is holy. There's no wrong in God. Um, man is not. I think there's definitely an element of that. Just like if you were a parent and your child, you know, has done something and you confront them about, you know, have they done something wrong and how they cower or you know hide away. Mm-hmm. Right, right. I think a lot of our relationship with God is a parent-child relationship in a way, too. It's very similar. So it's a good point. So again, this is a story of uh, God's timing. Versus uh, man's timing. So at age 80... This was God's timing, right? It wasn't Moses' timing. He was asking him to raise up and be a leader and lead the people out of Israel. And like I said, we all experience times in our lives where we struggle with God's timing versus our timing. Does anybody have a story or anybody have an experience they want to share where they've struggled to trust God's timing versus their timing? Sure. Okay, so God was raising up Moses to be a leader for the Israelites, and God tells us what was going to be the key to Moses' success in leading these people. We find that in Exodus 3.12. Can I get a reader for that? to Moses' success was that God was going to be with him. 
Moses wouldn't, he was not going to be able to do this on his own. Uh, God was going to have to work through him, and that's, that plays out for us today, too. Uh, we can't do anything on our own. God has to work through us and for us, and that's how we're going to be successful in life, is when God is with us and working through us. Right. Yes. The verse that you just read, I've read it many times, and I've never paid much attention to it before, but he's saying a sign, a sign uh, that I'll be with you is that you'll serve me on this mountain. You think about it, Moses returns to Egypt, A, as someone accused of murder, B, even if that's all forgotten, and he arrives, and he gets down there, the first thing he does is say, oh, by the way, I'm going to take all of your slaves and leave. Hope you like it because we're going to do it. You know, let them go. And he just keeps saying that. What are the odds he even stays alive? Right, yeah, yeah. What are the odds that yeah, and that's... somebody doesn't, the king doesn't try to kill him yeah. because of what he's trying to do and the, and the outcry and the unrest that he brings about by what he's doing. And the fact that he even leaves Egypt is something to be said. Mm -hmm. Then they arrive back at Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. And there and to worship God. I wonder if Moses at the time remembered like you said that big back here. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Hadn't hadn't thought of that or caught that. And I think a lot of times we read over these accounts and we don't put our feelings into it. Like that was big for Moses, like Brian was saying, to go before the king and to say these things. Like he risks his life. And you know, we can just read it in black and white text and not put a lot of feeling into that, but that's that's a big moment. Um, so God told Moses who he was. And that's one of our goals in doing this study is to learn more of who God is. So uh, in Exodus 3.14 it said, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Anybody confused by that? I get confused by that. God says, he identifies himself and he says, I am. Thoughts on what he meant by saying he is, I am. Well, I am in his present tense. Uh, I'm wondering if we've had a movement here in the United States a few years ago that said, God is dead. And I'm wondering if a lot of the Israelites that who have quit respecting God and quit loving God and quit thinking about God might have thought that God was dead. He, yes, there was a God, but he's Abraham's God. And Isaac and Jacob, he wasn't ours. And here's God reminding him that he is alive and well and present tense. Uh, New Testament tells us uh, yesterday, today, and forever that God is past tense, uh, present tense, and future tense. The problem they had was they needed a present tense. And that's what God gave him. He said, I am. And so that's, I think that's important. Yep. Yeah, remember that today. I think that's exactly it. So God, he's past tense, he's present tense, he's future tense. And I'm sure that was a comfort to them to know that. Uh, and it's also comforting to us to know that today, that God is eternal. He's always been. He's here now. And he's always going to be. It's interesting. It's very subtle in the New Testament. Of course, that makes sense because Jesus is God. Okay. Um, I want to talk about this for a while because I wanted to get your all's thoughts on it. So when Moses, or when God approached Moses, Moses kind of gave an excuse. He said that he wasn't eloquent of speech. But then if we turn over to the New Testament, we learn something else about Moses. And I'm wondering how we reconcile these two things. So in Exodus 4.10, this is what it says. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. 
And we flip over to Acts 7.22 and it says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. What's your thoughts? Was Moses just lying? Was he making an excuse? Or was he telling the truth? Or... I don't know that I have the answer. I was hoping you all would. <laughs> I mean, just because someone doesn't think they're good, someone doesn't mean they're terrible at it. I mean, I think it's, I mean, Moses well, truly could have been, you know, scared or nervous and not truly thinking he was that good at it. Not confident. He was actually decent. Yeah. yeah. I think we all do that to some extent. Yeah. I think it's the story of God, too, that He can use our weaknesses, He can use our failures for His glory. Right, it may have been true when Moses said it. Yeah. And then later on, I mean, the first time I ever spoke was probably the worst time. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That could be a perspective, too. Um Okay, so in this moment where God approaches Moses, he also kind of puts his work off on somebody else. He tries to. Uh, he says, you know, get somebody else who's better than me. And it says in Exodus 3.14, Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And I think there's a lesson there for us. You know, God has called us to work in his church. He's called us to work in his kingdom. And when we say, you know, somebody else can do that. I don't think that brings God a lot of joy. I think he probably reacts in the same way. His anger is probably still there. All right, so uh, Moses would go to Pharaoh and request that they let the Israelites go. And it said that God would harden Pharaoh's heart. And I want us to think, the way I understand God is God gives us self-will. But in these verses, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Was God controlling Pharaoh? What's your thoughts? If I remember correctly, God gave Pharaoh many times before it says, hey, Pharaoh's heart was hard. Mm -hmm. God, I don't want us to read those things and think that God was making. Pharaoh do something that he didn't want to do. These, these decisions that Pharaoh made, they were his decisions. God didn't make him make those decisions. Um, so when you read that, don't get confused and think that God was controlling Pharaoh. Pharaoh had the choice to let him go or to not let him go. So we get to the plagues. Uh, you know, Moses goes to Pharaoh. He asks for him to let the people go. And, of course, he refuses. And God reacts by bringing the plagues on the Egyptians. And, of course, we know there were ten of them. And I want us to think, what was God's purpose for these plagues? And we find the purpose, or the purposes in these verses I have on the screen. But does anybody know off the top of their heads, what was God's purpose in bringing these plagues on the Egyptians? Each one of the plagues attacked a god of the Egyptians. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that until the last year I had realized that. I don't think I really captured that as a kid in Sunday school class. Well, you taught it. <laughs> yeah. But if we turn to these verses. Uh, the purposes of God doing these things, it says, so that they would know He is the Lord. That's what it says in one of the verses. He also wanted them to realize that there was no one like him. And it also says to show his power so it might be proclaimed in all of the earth. Okay? So those are some of the reasons that God was doing these things to the Egyptians. Because they didn't know these things about God. And of course God still wants us to know these things today. All right. Who were the plagues directed at? The Egyptians, right? They weren't directed at the Israelites, were they? But you, 
we have something of pride that's so often overlooked in this. The Egyptians were extremely religious people. Yep. They were religious people, but they were wrongly religious. Uh -huh. They worshiped the wrong gods. Right. Yep. Well, that's what they said about the Muslims today. We said about today the world law. Yeah. Yeah. Today. They were religious. No doubt about that. They're wrong. Wrong. That's what it was. Okay, and it's been joked that 2020 is kind of like the times in Egypt. It's like, what plague are we going to endure this month? And I don't know if that's how God works. I don't know if there's truth to that. Um... But people have joked about that. But like Brad said, and I've got the different Egyptian gods that these plagues attacked. Each one of these plagues, again, it attacked an Egyptian god. It was to show that God is God. He's the one who is mighty. He is the one who is powerful. Not these gods that the Egyptians were worshiping. Um, so again, these plagues attacked these Egyptian gods. I see on the last one on your list is Pharaoh himself. Uh, Pharaoh uh, considered himself to be God. And there's a famous statues in Egypt of four of their gods depicted in Pharaoh sitting right in the row of the four, hmm. sitting right alongside each other. He's wow. another one of the gods. Hmm. Interesting. Is there anybody here besides me who thinks the God is trying to get more division from that time with this mountain now? So these plagues attacked these Egyptian gods, but I feel like coronavirus has also attacked some of our American gods because, you know, we were kind of on shutdown. Life was different for a few weeks, a few months. And I do find it interesting, you know, there wasn't any sports. It attacked vanity, entertainment, eating out, socializing, financial security, Jobs, materialism, staying busy, pride, vacationing in abundance, and just our control. Um, I don't know. I think I think it's interesting that over the past month those things kind of shut down, and I do think there's an element of worship to these things that we have in this country, and I think God may be trying to get us to think about that. So you read in El, uh, Exodus and throughout the other Old Testament books, it refers to God as being a jealous God. Is it okay that God is a jealous God? This is something I've been thinking about lately because when I was a kid, jealousy was taught as sin and you didn't want to be a jealous person, but God is a jealous God, so is that is that okay? And what is the meaning between, or what's the meaning of jealousy and envy? Yes. Right. Right. Yes. Exactly. So, uh, like worship, that's God's. So when people are worshiping other things, other gods, God is jealous. Because worship belongs to him. Right? But God's not an envious God. Envy's wanting what somebody else has. But he doesn't get envious of worship because it's already his. Does that make sense? 
So God's not an envious God, but he's a jealous God. I think it is okay for us to be jealous at times because God is also a jealous God and we're made in his image. Thank you all for participating. Who's next week? Brian is next week. We'll be in, I think, chapters 11 through 20. So.